This is Matt Thurber, Editor-in-Chief of AIN. We stopped producing Tales from the Flight Deck in February 2020 after the tragically early passing of Pete Coombs, the brains and the voice behind this podcast. Last year, Srinan Sadal, an airline pilot based in Singapore, reached out and offered to help get Tales from the Flight Deck back up and running. He used to listen to each episode with colleagues, after which they would talk about lessons learned. Now, we're never going to be able to recreate the voice and the narrative that Pete Combs brought to this episode, but we can only hope to carry on his initial idea of discussing real-life aviation experiences to further aviation safety around the globe. If you or someone you know has their own Tales from the Flight Deck story, please reach out to us at ainedit at ainonline.com. An Airbus A330 crew experiences something they've never trained for. Too much power to land and no way to reduce that power. Cathay Pacific Flight 780 was on the final leg of a trip from Surabaya, Indonesia, to Hong Kong International Airport with 309 passengers and 13 crew on board when this dangerous incident occurred. Here with us today is Captain Malcolm Waters to explain exactly what happened, how he and his crew handled the situation, leading to a successful outcome, and the lessons he learned from that hazardous situation. This is AIN's Tales from the Flight Deck. This podcast comes from AIN Media, publishers of the Aviation International News Magazine, and AIN's online and digital products. I'm Matt Thurber, Editor-in-Chief of AIN Media. And I'm Srinan Sadle. And this is Episode 29 of Tales from the Flight Deck. April 13th, 2010, Captain Malcolm Waters and First Officer David Hayhoe were descending for a landing at Hong Kong International Airport in a Cathay Pacific Airbus A330, designated Flight 780. Something unexpected was about to happen, but there had been some subtle cues that all was not well with the Airbus's engines. Malcolm, can you describe the atmosphere just before approaching Hong Kong when everything was normal? Yes, uh, we had uh, reported for duty on the morning uh, of the flight and everything uh, was a beautiful day. It was a blue sky day very good flying conditions. The weather was good. The no temps were great. The refueling uh, system uh, at the airport was uh, no tamed out of service because there was construction. But um, other than that, it's just a normal day, a normal working day. But there were some indications of a potential problem after takeoff when you were at top of climb, when the ECAM first uh, displayed an engine to control system fault error. What was going through your thoughts when that happened? Well, first of all, uh, after departure, we took off and we're climbing to our cruise level. I noticed uh, in the corner of my eye on the uh, engine pressure ratio gauge on on the number two engine, I noticed it flickering a little bit, but there was no message yet on the uh, ECAM. So uh, I just watched it and I thought um, once we get to cruise, um, I'll I'll have a bit of a a better look at it when uh, the workload comes down. 
And then once we we arrived at cruise level, I sort of had a look at the fluctuating EPA, and it was about that time where we got the the Inch Two Control Sys Fault message. Uh, you know, Inch Two Control Sys Fault. Um, Eng2 slow response, I think, was the, the next line, and that's it. There's no checklist to, to do, um, essentially. You, you would clear that message, and it's brought it to your attention. And, uh, of course, we then had the time in the cruise to take out the QRH and have a look to see if there's anything in there that could, could give us some more information. I take out the, the flight crew operating manuals and I have a look there at the description of the system and and. and and what exactly that message means. And there was not really that much information that told you specifically, you know, what what triggered that fault, because it could be a whole lot of things. We then spoke with engineering on the phone, you know, told them that what our message was and what the symptom was. They weren't you know, overly concerned. They possibly thought that it was an indication issue. The engines was running fine, and we did try, you know, moving the, the thrust lever to see if it would respond, and it did. It was just monitor it further. That was sort of the advice that we received from uh, you know, maintenance control in Hong Kong. I believe we climbed to 39,000 feet out of Surabaya. And then as you reach the island of Borneo, you turn left and start heading a bit further north, more direct towards Hong Kong. And that results in you now having to change from easterly cruising levels to westerly cruising levels. So we had to change from 39,000 feet to 38. On that descent, we got a the control sys fault message again. So we, you know, we, we cleared the ECAM as per we had done the first time. Then we leveled off at 38,000 feet. That's it. The, the message is, is gone again. So that's where, you know, I called uh, maintenance control a second time. Had anything been done overnight in Surabaya, you know, that possibly the paperwork wasn't correct in the tech log, for example, you maybe something got missed. Nothing had been done, you know, that they knew. And they said, no, it's just sat on the ground. The EPA has a digital readout inside the, uh, the dial of the, of the needle. There's a little window that has the digital readout. And if I watched the digital numbers, uh, I could see that the, the thousandth uh, number was rolling up and down in a rhythmic way. And I mentioned this to, to make maintenance control. This is where they had mentioned that they'd had this before. So the aircraft that had come out of Surabaya the day before us um, had had EPA fluctuations. And in fact, their fluctuations were worse than ours. But what they did is when the aeroplane arrived in Hong Kong, they changed the fuel metering unit. That seemed to have rectified the problem. So he told me that I'll probably end up changing the FMU in Hong Kong when you arrive. Uh, follow the ECAM, follow procedures. And, uh, and I asked specifically why then is number one also fluctuating and the explanation was when the the number two engine goes over target uh, the aircraft speeds up slightly and subsequently the auto thrust puts a demand in to, to take thrust off um, number one responds appropriately the thrust comes off number one but of course the aircraft then starts to slow because as number two fluctuates back down and below target the aircraft now starts to decelerate and then subsequently the auto thrust system will say, okay, add, add, add some thrust and number one responds appropriately. So what you're getting is you're getting number one in a counter response to number two. You know, as number two goes below target, number one picks up the slack. When number two goes over target, number one backs off. And then as this happens, it's a rhythmic kind of um, moving of the thrust, if you like. So the explanation from the maintenance in Hong Kong was enough to put your spidey senses to rest? Yes, yeah, seemed like a plausible explanation. I, I could accept that and I thought, yes, that does make sense. I didn't believe that, that we were in any, any sort of danger. So yeah, off we went, we continued. So tell us about what happened when you started the descent to Hong Kong. Okay, yeah. So I, I did think then that it's not a you know, it's not an indication issue, but I thought it doesn't really matter. And also, you know, there's no checklist. You know, when you look up control sys fault in the FCOM, it just says slow response. The FCOMs are not a maintenance manual. They're a pilot manual sort of thing, right? Flight crew operations manual. So to the pilot, you have no idea what 
has caused the control sys fault. It could be about 11 or 12 things. So, um, you know, you're not immediately thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is a, you know, a land ASAP amber where, you know, um, you would be thinking about diverting at least somewhere, if not immediately, like a, a red a red message would be. Once we got to Hong Kong and we decided descending, we get the control system fault come up. And by now, of course, it's becoming quite a routine part of the flight. As we approached about 28,000 feet, then we got the Eng2 stall. I wouldn't say that, you know, when the Eng2 stall came up that I was extremely startled. It was like a like a confirmation then that that um, yeah, there's definitely something wrong, you know, more seriously with this engine than just a you know a fluctuating EPA. But the aeroplane can fly on, on, on one engine, so it's not like you're worried about the outcome of the flight. It's just like, oh, this is definitely not just an indication problem now. And uh, when we closed the thrust lever and looked at the parameters, like the fuel flow, rotation of the three rotors, EGT, things like that, they're all, they're all green. There's nothing outside of limits. But we've got this, you know, inch to store message. So rather than, you know, continue with the, um, you know, the checklist, which is to switch it off, um, you know, we sort of decided to keep it running at idle. Like, obviously... There's something not right with engine two because we've had this control sys fault message, you know, for most of the flight. But now, you know, we're not going to just try and run it as normal now because there seems to be a problem. But when we're running it at idle, it's just fine. Nothing's out of limits. We've got all the services from that engine. So we've got the generator, we've got the bleed air, we've got hydraulic power. So let's just run it at idle. We'll consider the engine to be unusable and we'll land in Hong Kong. And you know, I could talk to the in-flight services manager and let her know that we've, we've had a problem and, and get any information from her, you know, with regards to is there any indications or smells in the cabin that, that she feels that, that are unusual and, uh, and give her a time frame for, for what's happening and how long she's got to prepare the cabin. Tell us about when uh, things started to go wrong with the second engine. Well, now we're tracking direct to, uh, you know, base leg and uh, air traffic control have told us, you know, to descend. And there's a couple of altitude constraints that you have to meet uh, on the arrivals into Hong Kong, which are to do with departures, really. You know, they want you down below the uh, outbound aircraft. So um, we'd met that. So that meant that we were, you know, down at 13,000 feet, a long way out to sea, you know, well, well below profile. When we got cleared down to 8,000, we had an engine one control sys fault and we hadn't even begun the mouth music of handling, you know, the reading of that message when we got engine one stall. That was where I sort of had that feeling of like, like this can't, no, that can't be right. It's engine two again. And I reread the ECAM and it had engine one stall. And I just, I just froze. I couldn't believe it. And I, I thought, oh my God, you know, this is because we're so far below profile. There's no hope of gliding to Hong Kong from that spot. You know, that's where you get all those, those feelings of uh, fight or flight. It was uh, quite intense. And I really thought, oh, we could be in grave danger. And the sort of natural human responses to grave danger you know, the hair standing up on the back of your neck, your mouth running dry, tightening of the, of the stomach. You know, obviously my heart rate, I would imagine it would have been increasing. You feel that uh, everything slows down and your, your focus suddenly shifts down to what is threatening your life. And uh, for me, it was the, that message on the ECAM, you know, I'm looking at it like in disbelief. You seemed to run through... Uh, a sequence of emotions. The first one is fright. The second one was like disbelief, like, no, that can't be it. And then the third was like anger, like, why me? This is not fair. The fourth was like a bit like despair, like, well, this is the end, you know? And this is, I suppose, where you could become, you know, stuck in a feedback loop of going through those emotions that deer in the headlights position where you're just frozen. I explain all those feelings to you and it takes me a minute to, to say it all. It probably was like one second. 
it felt like an eternity that I was sitting there, you know, just sort of not knowing what to do next. I, I remember I sat back in the seat. I looked out the window. I looked down at the South China Sea and it was, there was a lot of white caps. It was blowing quite a lot. It was a good 20 knots of breeze down on the water there. I looked at my FMA, you know, the flight mode enunciator for the first time in, you know, what seemed like an eternity. I could see that, wow, geez, we're slow, you know. So immediately, uh, you know, I disconnected the autopilot and, and started flying the aircraft manually, got rid of the flight director and got back to minimum clean speed. The next part of that is navigate. Where are we going to go? And I started thinking about, you know, where, like what island can I get to? And there was none at that stage. We were still, I think, 47 miles to run to Hong Kong. Once you started putting one foot in front of the other, you felt like you were getting back a little bit of control. Like you might not have total control of the scenario, but you felt like you had something to do and and that something you can try to try and make this situation at least better. And that's where you sort of start becoming a pilot again rather than a passenger. What exactly was the engine doing? Did you have power? Yeah, well, um, essentially now both engines were stalled and they were at idle thrust. Meanwhile, David's doing the ditching checklist. I'm, I'm flying, I'm keeping visual. I'm not going into cloud. Uh, I want to keep my eyes on the ocean. So I'm flying around the cumulus and, uh, and I'm maintaining you know, best glide speed. This is what was perplexing. The engine stall checklist says, you know, thrust lever idle parameters check if abnormal off. When you had the thrust lever at idle, when you looked at all the parameters, they're normal. They're all green. It's just that they wouldn't the thrust lever, they wouldn't respond to the thrust lever movement. Something stopped me from switching them off. And it was a little turbulent down there. We were bouncing around a bit. But at some point, I put my sort of fingers down at the very base of the thrust lever and I could pinch it and just move it like a millimeter by millimeter and I started doing that with number one I just moved it up a millimeter up a millimeter up a millimeter a very very slow advance of the thrust lever it seemed to be working eventually I got enough thrust on number one that I could maintain level flight and that was exciting I thought that will get us to the airport on the way in you know to this to this base leg the question then becomes, what do you do when you get to the airport? Like, we're, we're at 5,000 feet, we're coming in. ATC had offered basically us anything we wanted. So, you know, I didn't want to fly a long final approach on an ILS. I just didn't trust that number one engine. I thought it could roll back to zero at any point. And, and it's, you know, it's taken quite a long time to be able to get thrust out of it to, to where it is now. I thought if I got onto the ILS and try to control that engine, it might just stall and go back to, to idle again and we're going to be ditching anyway. This is where I went back to you know my GA days. You know, I was a flight instructor teaching in Cessnas, you know, my one of my first jobs and I don't know how many thousand force landings I did out at a field. You know, I basically turned it into that. And I thought I'm going to take the airplane to a to a high right base. You know, once I'm committed to the field, I'll close the lever and I'll configure for landing. And then, if the engine does what it's told to do, great. If it doesn't, meaning it goes to idle and, and it gets stuck at idle, that's fine because uh, I can just glide. I remembered from my command course, you know, uh, rough figures for an for an all engine flame out approach and landing, and uh, the profile is roughly double normal profile. The speed I'll use is, you know, VLS plus 10, which is the, the little amber, you know, minimum speed. I'll add 10 knots to that on the on the speed tape, and that'll be my approach speed, and, and that's what we'll do. So once we got to that spot, I, I began the approach. It was a visual approach. Now, at that point, I didn't really look at what the engine actually did. I just closed the thrust levers and assumed it was at idle. I'm flying my approach, but it's not looking right. Like the aircraft should be coming down like a brick, you know, 600 feet per nautical mile or thereabouts. And we're not. We're coming down at, a, you know, sort of more normal rates of descent. 
I just couldn't seem to be getting rid of this height. And I, and I again, I was getting that feeling again, that, that hair standing up. I'm missing something. There's something that's not right here. And I'm, and I kind of rechecked everything. I, I looked. Yep, yep. Thrusters at idle. Gear is down. Flaps down. I even had speed brake. I even took the speed brake. It was about then that I looked up at the EPA gauge uh, for the first time, and, and as I've said before, like my blood ran cold. I just saw the EPA gauge at like about the 10 o'clock position on number one, and I just, you got to be joking. I can't cop it, catch a break today. You know, like I, I'd planned for the engine going to idle and not coming back. You know, I'd planned for the engine working normally, but, but flying this abnormal approach and how I would do that, I had not any idea that it would be stuck, you know, and now trying to come down and. I sort of had all those feelings again of of that fear, and like this is not going to be a successful outcome. The, the the disbelief, the anger, you know, the the resignation, sort of, you know, like oh, we're stuffed. We had the ground pox starting to come off now. We're getting down amongst the hills. Um, you know, we're getting the don't sink, so the, the, the terrain ahead, the uh, eventually the whoop, whoop, pull up, pull up, terrain, terrain, you know, yeah, all these things, you know. I just, I, I kind of call it like Moses parting the Red Sea, you know. I just pushed all of those distractions to the side and cleared a path for myself down the middle. And I thought, I'm going to fly the aeroplane and I'm going to put it on the ground. I knew I had to take the airplane for more track miles, so I immediately did a very steep turn to the left away from the airport. And I took it through the localizer, and then I rolled it back to the right, and I did these big S turns, just getting rid of the height. And we're getting the constant chiming, you know, of the overspeed warning. I just ignored it all. And I thought, I'm going to try and put the airplane down at the, as close as I can to the end of the strip. And then I want to try and dissipate as much energy as possible down that strip. I didn't think we'd stop, but um, I thought I'm going to try and come off at a manageable speed. The problem at that at that speed is that your attitude, your nose attitude is low, and so if we just flew down into the ground, we would hit the nose wheel first. I was cognizant of not wheelbarrowing it, where you just you touch down nose wheel first, you know. But any kind of positive nose attitude, and the thing would climb. So I had to tr kind of try and three point it. We had a hundred knots airspeed over the normal approach speed. Normally we'd be about 140, and we were like 240. And when I pulled my normal pull, it was like whoa! You could really feel it, like on a roller coaster. And uh, but you know the airplane. Yeah, and it was a crosswind from the right, so I had a little bit of, you know, I was ro rolled to the right a little bit, and we touched down on the right gear first, and, um, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of energy was absorbed, but also given back, and the airplane rolled quite hard to the left. And I remember, you know, oh, this is it, you know, thinking, oh, gosh, you know, so, such a violent sort of roll to the left, and I had like full full ailerons in trying to pick up the left wing and I even used a bit of rudder to try and pick the wing up and and managed to you know we did end up taking the drain mast off number one engine in that situation we grazed the engine but um I got it back under control and of course now we're, we're heading back airborne again and and uh when I pushed forward on the stick uh, once again you're in this sort of direct law so I moved the stick like what would be like half a centimeter I think you know, whoa, it was like negative G, you know, like my headset almost came off my head, you know, and we're, 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 we're heading back down to the runway and I very quickly had to learn, you know, the finite movements on the side stick that were acceptable. And I sort of just got the airplane back under control and then I sort of was feeling for the ground and, and I managed to, you know, I think I skipped one more time on the surface and then settled on the third time. And then uh, when I pulled in the reverses, uh, we got it. We got reverse on number one. And, uh, um, you know, I could, I could apply braking and just held the brakes. 
and of course um, we stopped you know 500 feet from the end so <laughs> I mean it's a 12,400 foot runway in Hong Kong it's as, as long as there is in the region that 498 feet or whatever it is after 12,000 it was was applicable you know we used every inch told that story for a while. <laughs> Malcolm, what you just described is just a fascinating piece of airmanship. It almost sounds like you had uh, three emergencies rolled into one, if not, if not more. But you came to a stop and the job was not done yet. After that was the, the big call, right? The, the, the evacuation. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, so stopped the aircraft. We put the park brake on. The number one engine was was out there screaming like a banshee, so immediately I said, you know, like let's you know shut them down. So you know, Dave flicked the the two switches and we shut down the engines. We were sitting there with the APU running as if we were at the gate. Everything's powered. We've got air conditioning on. No one's got a scratch. And it was like I can't believe it. We got away with it. You know, like it's almost like you did something naughty and you got away with it. It was like this exhilarating feeling of like. Yeah, you know, two minutes ago, I didn't think I was going to be walking on the earth anymore. You know, I didn't find that your life flashed before your eyes. It was more the things I hadn't done or wasn't going to do that I found, you know, that were haunting me. You know, I hadn't had children yet. You know, I'd only been married about eight months at the time and and I hadn't seen my, my family, you know, in a while. And, uh, and I was regretting, you know, those opportunities that I could have had to go home that I didn't and things like that. The temperature readout goes in increments of five. So, you know, normally you might see 155 degrees or 365 degrees or something like that on the wheel brake temperatures. And these things were ticking up like a Las Vegas slot machine. You know, tick, 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 500 degrees, you know, 600, 700, 800, 900, 995. That's as high as the gauge can go. Uh, and it was 995 all wheels. And I thought, my gosh, we've got to be on fire. I didn't want to order an evacuation without confirmation. So we spoke to the tower. We asked them if they could see any fire, and they said that they couldn't. But to call you know, the rescue services who were by this stage turning up, there was trucks turning up, and there's a discrete frequency you can use to talk to them. I got on to the, uh, the, the fire rescue leader, is the call sign. He's... And a Cantonese speaker who's speaking English. I'm wanting information from him that's very specific. And uh, I'm speaking in English. So um, it was difficult. And they have a checklist, you know. And the first questions I think he said to me was, you know, are the, is the park brake set? And I said, yes, the park brake is set. Do you see fire? Are we on fire? And he maybe didn't even hear me. He just was in his mind, like, what's my next question? on his checklist and, and he kind of, you know, he didn't answer. He just said, is the engine shut down? I said, yes, the engines are shut down. Are we on fire? Can you see a fire? And again, he didn't answer me. He said, um, what is the brake temperature? And I'm thinking, dude, like I said, it's a thousand degrees. I said, it's 995, all wheels. Are we on fire? And he said, yes, there's fire on wheel, you know? And I sat back and I looked at Dave and, and I said, I think we've got to get off. What do you think? And he said, I agree, I think we're going to get off. When I gave the evacuation command, the flight attendants were primed and ready and they were instantaneous. You could, you could feel the doors opening, like thump, thump. You could hear them yelling, you know, evacuate, evacuate. And, uh, and you could also feel the aircraft. By now, the, the, the tyres are starting to go. So you feel the airplane sort of shake and, and, and you know, oh, what was that? It's a bit like when they put a cargo pod on the aircraft and you feel them, you feel the aircraft go, boom, and you go, geez, that was a bit, you know, you could be a bit more gentle on that. And it sort of just added that level of urgency, like this is not over. 
yeah, they got everyone off in very close to regula- regulation time. I mean, uh, we had 322 people on the airplane and it was evacuated you know, within two minutes. And then you're on the ground looking at the carnage and, uh, you know, it was like a, a movie set. So Malcolm, uh, the investigation took its own time, but what were the findings from that investigation? Essentially, they had done, um, as I briefly alluded to in the introduction, there was a NOTAM saying that the underground refueling system at the gates we were parked at in Surabaya were unserviceable. That NOTAM had been up for a while because they were extending the underground refuel uh, gallery uh, to more gates. So they had dug up, you know, the ground to put new piping in. The contractor who had done that work had finished the work and had told the operator, the airfield operator, we're done. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, Catch you later. And the refuel installation owner, which is a petro, you know, chemical company, they now have to do a recommissioning of the refueling gallery before it gets put back into service. And unfortunately, the airfield operator took it that when the contractor said they're done, that that's it, the work's done, and re- lifted the NOTAM. So a, a, commission, a recommissioning of the, of the refuel installation had not happened. Now, Surabaya is, uh, I think, three feet elevation. It's very, very low level. So you don't have to dig down into the ground very far before you hit bed, you know, uh, groundwater. And it's right next to the ocean. Like when you're sitting at the airport, you're looking out and there's a few ponds and then the sea. And a lot of salt water and seawater had got into the piping. They did a pressure test, apparently. You know, they run some water through to check all the welds, but they hadn't recommissioned it yet. So now we're refilling aircraft and there's salt water in the fuel. The refuel truck uh, that pumps the the fuel up has a bunch of uh, filter monitors, uh, filters essentially, they call them filter monitors, and the fuel gets pumped inside the filters through them and comes out the other side and then goes up to the aircraft. And the filters are made from a polymer, which is exactly the same sort of stuff that's used in, say, uh, a baby's nappies where if you pour water into a nappy, the polymer absorbs the water so that if you turn the nappy upside down, the water won't come out. It's just absorbent. They call it super absorbent polymers or SAPs. Apparently, in the, the, day or, the two or three days before our incident, um, the filters on that truck had been changed a number of times because it's, they're doing their job. They're absorbing all this water, and, and, and normally those filters are changed maybe once a year. The second thing is as the filters absorb water, they swell, which means that they they start to restrict the flow of fuel. So as you're pumping fuel through the filter, the flow rate drops as more and more water is absorbed. Now, the refuel operator is supposed to monitor um, these parameters, and when they're outside of normal operating uh, tolerances, investigate why. This didn't happen. And in fact, the refueler would just turn the pressure up to get the flow rate back and eventually just blew the filters to smithereens. And all that polymer went into the aircraft. The fuel filters on the aircraft um, are designed to catch you know, impurities, but because the polymer was smaller than the aircraft filters, it went through. You know, that engine's a, a multi-spool engine, three-spool, three-stage engine, and we use fuel as a lubricant, um, as a hydraulic fl- fluid and as a coolant. So uh, it doesn't just go into the engine and get burnt like it does on an older generation aircraft. Um, a number of other airlines had been refueled from those gates, but they didn't have issues because it's older tech. You know, the fuel just gets pushed into the, uh, into the combustion chamber and burnt. But in our case, the polymer made its way into all these little intricate parts of the engine. It was when we did that little descent that we talked about earlier from 39 down to 38, when the engines come off to try and give you that descent and the valves need to shift to a position that is quite different than, say, cruise thrust or climb thrust. A a, a little motor 
gets overtalked or you know um, that's one of the parameters that trigger control assist fault and of course when we level off at 38,000 feet and the thrust goes back up um, it's satisfied again so the message disappears um, essentially you know the problems came when you're trying to run the engines at, at a much lower rpm than than when the contaminant went through okay finally malcolm what would you like to tell pilots from young to old about preparing for and dealing with emergency situations like flight 780 as as is always the case uh, with flying um very early on you know we are taught about you know aviate navigate communicate you know that basic old adage of you know when things start going wrong or you're not sure what's happening just go back to the very basics to start with you know whether you're flying a tiger moth or you're flying uh, a space shuttle i think that um you know when you feel that i just i'm just being overwhelmed here and i don't know what's happening i found that stepping back to that um most basic of things that was what helped me get over that startle factor that aviate navigate communicate you know is a wonderful you know little phrase and it gets you back to a place where you know you, you know you're a pilot and you can start being a pilot again you know you do have to deal with some of that you know in after an incident like this you know that that monday morning quarterbacking where um people are going to talk about you and 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 maybe i would have done this or i would have done that don't worry about any of that stuff all you're doing is you're trying to get the airplane and its occupants you know back on the ground and home to their families and so you need to just you know fall back on your basic skills and use that you know to to just do what you think is right That's it for this edition of AIN's Tales from the Flight Deck. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Malcolm Waters, for an incredible and inspiring story. <laughs>